It's now more than 40 years since Stanley Kubrick began his quest for the proverbial good science fiction movie, and already the 1960s seemed to belong to another age. Only a handful of men and one woman had gone into space, and though President Kennedy had announced that the United States would put a man on the moon before the end of the decade, I doubt if many people believed it would actually happen. Moreover, our genuine knowledge of our neighbors in space was still virtually zero. We couldn't even be sure that the first probe to touch down on the moon would not instantly sink into a sea of dust, as some astronomers had confidently predicted. So, in writing our storyline, at the early dawn of the space age, Stanley and I had a credibility problem. We wanted to create something realistic and plausible that would not be made obsolete by the events of the next few years. And though our original working title was How the Solar System Was Won, Stanley was aiming at something more than a straightforward tale of exploration. As he was fond of telling me, what I want is a theme of mythic grandeur. Well, as the real year 2001 approaches, the movie has become part of popular culture. I doubt if even his wildest dreams, Stanley imagined that one day uh, about a hundred million Americans would know exactly who or what was speaking when a Super Bowl commercial announced in a silken yet sinister voice, it was a bug, Dave. And by the way, if anyone still believes the legend that Hal was derived from IBM by displacing one letter of the alphabet, let me once again point wearily to chapter 16 for the correct origin of the name. Nowadays, even in my own mind, book and movie tend to be confused with each other and with reality. The various sequels make the situation even more complicated. So I'd like to go back to the beginning and recall how the whole thing started. In April 1964, I left Salon, as it was then called, and went to New York to complete my editorial work on the Time Life book, Man and Space. It progressed very smoothly because whenever one of Time Life's zealous researchers asked me, what is your authority for this statement, I'd fix it with a basilisk stare and answer, you're looking at him. So I had ample energy for moonlighting with Stanley, and our first encounter was in Trader Vic's on April 23rd. They should put up a plaque to mark the spot. Stanley was still basking in the success of his last movie, Dr. Strangelove, and was looking for an even more ambitious theme. He wanted to make a movie about man's place in the universe, a project likely to give a heart attack to any studio head of the old school, or for that matter, the new one. Now, before you make a movie, you have to have a script. And before you have a script, you have to have a story. Though some avant-garde directors have tried to dispense with the latter item, you'll find their work only at art theatres. I'd already given Stanley a list of my shorter pieces, and we decided that one, The Sentinel, contained a basic idea on which we could build. The Sentinel was written in an explosion of energy at Christmas 1948 as my entry for a BBC short story competition. It wasn't even placed, and I've sometimes wondered who did win. It's now been anthologized so often that I need only say that it's a mood piece about the discovery of an alien artifact on the moon, a kind of burglar alarm waiting to be set off by mankind's arrival. 2001 is often said to be based on the Sentinel, but that's a gross oversimplification. The two bear much the same relationship as an acorn and an oak tree. It needed a lot more material to make the movie, and some of it came from another short story, Encounter in the Dawn, and four other shorts. But most of it was wholly new, and the result of months of brainstorming with Stanley, followed by lonely, well, <laughs> fairly lonely, hours in room 1008 of the famous Hotel Chelsea on 23rd Street, which I was happy to revisit only a few months ago. That's where most of the novel was written, and the journal of this often painful process 
uh, I've recorded in my book, The Lost Worlds of 2001, which gives a lot of the alternative storylines. But why write a novel, you may ask, when we are aiming to make a movie? It's true that novelizations, horrible word, are all too often produced afterwards. But in this case, Stanley had excellent reasons for reversing the process. Because a screenplay has to specify everything in excruciating detail, it's almost as tedious to read as to write. John Fowles put it very well when he said, Writing a novel is like swimming through the sea. Writing a film script is like thrashing through treacle. And perhaps because Stanley realized that I have a low tolerance for boredom, <clears throat> he suggested that before we embark on the drudgery of the script, we let our imagination soar freely by writing a complete novel uh, from which we could later derive the script uh, and hopefully a little cash. Well, that's more or less the way it worked out, though towards the end, novel and screenplay were being written simultaneously with feedback in both directions. Thus, I rewrote some sections after seeing the movie Rushes, a rather expensive method of literary creation which few other authors can have enjoyed, uh, though I'm not sure if enjoyed is the right word. To give the flavor of that hectic time, here's some extracts from the journal I must have hastily written in the smaller hours of the morning, May 28, 1964. Suggested to Stanley that they might be machines who regard organic life as a hideous disease. Stanley thinks this is cute. July 11th. Joined Stanley to discuss plot development, but spent almost all the time arguing about Cantor's transfinite groups. That's numbers beyond infinity. I decide that he's a latent mathematical genius. July 12th. Now we have everything except the plot. July 26, Stanley's 36th birthday. Went to the village and found a card with the inscription, How can you have a happy birthday when the whole world may blow up at any minute? Uh, September 28, dreamed I was a robot being rebuilt. Took two chapters to Stanley, who cooked me a fine steak, remarking, Joe Levine doesn't do this for his writers. <laughs> December 10, Stanley calls me after screening H.D. Wells's Things to Come and says you'll never see another movie I recommend. December 24, slowly tinkering with the final pages so I can have them as a Christmas present for Stanley. This last entry on Christmas Eve records my hope that the novel was now essentially complete. In fact, all we had was merely a rough draft of the first two-thirds stopping at the most exciting point, because we hadn't the faintest idea what would happen next. But it was enough to let Stanley set up the deal with MGM and Cinerama for what was originally trumpeted as Journey Beyond the Stars. Throughout 1965, Stanley was involved in the incredibly complex post-production activities, made even more difficult by the fact that the film would be shot in England while he was still in New York and under no circumstances would he travel by air. I'm in no position to criticize. Stanley learned not to fly the hard way by getting his pilot's license. Uh, for similar reasons, I've never been behind a steering wheel since the day I barely passed my driving test in Sydney, Australia in 1956. And I too was cured for life by the traumatic experience. While Stanley was making the movie, I was trying to complete the final, final version of the novel, which of course had to receive his blessing before it could be published. This proved extremely difficult to obtain, partly because he was so busy at the studio that he never had time to focus his attention on the many versions of the manuscript. He swore he wasn't dragging his feet to make certain that the movie appeared before the book. <laughs> 